great pleasure talking today to Dr. Ravi Dadani, who is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, chief academic officer at Mass General Brigham. So, uh, Ravi, may I first ask you, what will you talk about at the RI conference? I'm looking forward to the RI conference, uh, Peter, and uh, my hope is to look at the series of testing, really, and how has testing played an important role, obviously, during this pandemic. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conference. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, when did you actually hear the first time about COVID-19 and, and did you expect it to become such a global health crisis? You know, uh, first of all, I will say no for the last question, and that is, did I expect this? Um, many of us in the academic world had heard about a series of infections in Seattle a choir study that captured interest just because of its interesting way of, of, of transmission. It was then, of course, traced back uh, to China. And the question is, would we have expected it to really go beyond there? We had heard certainly outbreaks of MERS and SARS and so forth restricted in Asia. And as is typical, most of us on the East Coast, at least, were in denial that really the infection was going to spread beyond those contained areas. Now, of course, the infectious disease people in our community had said, look, we will have an outbreak mm -hmm. and an, uh, a pandemic in our lifetime. It's just a matter of when. Of course, everyone was expecting it to be influenza. So that was when we first heard about it and certainly did not anticipate this to uh, be as big as it did. Yeah. Now, are you actually satisfied with the response by academia yeah. to the COVID-19 crisis? You know, Peter, the question is, the virus can mutate incredibly well. The question is, did we in academia mutate? And I would say yes. And surprisingly, we pivoted in almost a Silicon Valley kind of fashion. And if one, to, if one had to ask, what were those areas that we changed? We changed the way we develop our tests, work with industry, work with government, change from focusing our studies in more general areas to really moving to COVID-related studies. In our own organization, in a period of 16 weeks, we were able to stand up over 600 different studies, almost 100 clinical trials. That's about 35 to 40 essentially new studies a week. Mm -hmm. We were able to get those approved within 10 days, contracting as well as uh, grant submissions and so forth. So we have pivoted. Um, could we have done more? Absolutely. But I'm incredibly proud of the academic response. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, something really hopeful. And I have to say also, I experienced experience this hands, all hands on deck attitude and it was just an amazing uh, and very satisfying, gratifying experience, certainly also on, on our end at the Renal Research yeah. Institute. Now, yeah, your, Ravi, your talk will deal a lot about tests. Can, can you just say a few words about the tests that are currently available? Sure, um, I, I think really the, the, the lay public the scientists, physicians, clinicians, even children uh, are pretty familiar with testing yeah. these days, just given the amount and the wealth of information. The controversies early on in the pandemic that the testing raised, at least in the United States, and then the subsequent um, evolution of, of where we are today, PCR, uh, antigen testing, and, and serology. And my hope is during the conference to run through quickly uh, what each of them means, but more importantly, what they mean in our dialysis population. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, your talk will deal a lot with uh, uh, Mass General Hospital's uh, response and, and strategy to address COVID-19. So what's the current status? Well, obviously, running a hospital, we have to employ tests that have incredibly high sensitivity and incredibly high specificity. Mm -hmm. And so our testing strategy really throughout our system, and we have 16 essentially different sites, uh, we have focused on PCR testing. Yeah. That said, in our community setting, outside of the hospital setting, there are other strategies. Perhaps antigen testing uh, is also attractive. Yeah. Yeah. So Ravi, what would you think is an optimal testing strategy for dialysis centers um, with respect to PCR, serology, other other tests you could think of, uh, antigen tests. Uh, what's the strategy you could envision? Right, um, right. What we've seen, uh, Peter, in the PCR world, if you will, are PCR tests that have become more widely available. They've become much more rapid. 
And importantly, the supply chain for those PCR tests, for the most part, have actually improved. And so in the ideal world, cost not included, PCR would be ideal. That said, if we're looking for rapid screening, asymptomatic, and good quality tests, I think in the next few months we'll get to the point where antigen testing, especially given the rapidity of the result, yep. will be an important strategy to implement in the outpatient setting. Yeah. As, as you know, the Rhin Research Institute has, has embarked on research into pool testing. Right. What, is your, um, what are your thoughts around pool testing in general? Yeah, I think from the community standpoint, pool testing is attractive. However, early on in this pandemic, certainly pool testing, uh, given the high prevalence of the condition in certain areas, was not ideal. Pool testing, of course, becomes much more important in areas where the r not, if you will, is on the lower side. Mm -hmm. What's even more interesting is recently work done I believe by RI and even from Israel, have been able to put together algorithms that allow pool testing to be done that actually reduce cost and improve turnaround on identifying the exact patient that might be infected. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in parts of the world, uh, sm uh, smartphone apps are used to track patients with COVID and they are also used by the general population who is not yet affected by COVID. So what is your view about these apps and their application in the US in specific? Well, I'll say first and foremost, we are a single world. We are a single community. And that's what this pandemic has taught us. Humility and flexibility have really been at the forefront in terms of how best to respond to this particular pandemic. Clearly, there are places in the world that have adapted different technologies, whether they be apps or even, or even testing strategies. If we are arrogant and not uh, able to bring in those technologies into the United States, really shame on us, because there's been a wealth of information and, and really terrific strategies adapted. So apps in particular, in different parts of the world, they're incredibly useful. Now, obviously, you have to superimpose upon them a community response, oversight, we worry about privacy here, but the question is how do you adapt these kinds of technologies because they clearly have been adapted in other parts of the world and made uh, really effective means of, of, of responding to the pandemic. Yeah, so, so you would expect that there is some development in this area also here in the US? Well, clearly you're already seeing some development. Uh, in my hospital, you can't actually get into the hospital until you have an app that clears mm -hmm. you, for example. But that app doesn't necessarily tell me if I'm next to somebody or yeah. been exposed yeah. to somebody who might have been infected yeah. recently. And we certainly need to get there. Yeah, I mean, th there is a, a great push to develop uh, prediction models to identify patients possibly even asymptomatic ones who may have uh, COVID-19 and patients who might be at particularly high risk for uh, COVID-19. Recently, the NIH uh, issued a request for pro uh, and a request for proposals. So what, how important do you think will prediction models become moving forward? Sure. Well, there's always a challenge with prediction models in terms of how accurate uh, they are and what information went into those models to yield essentially the result. We use prediction models, at least in our own organization and really throughout Massachusetts to figure out how frequently, how frequently should we test students that are coming back to college. How frequently should we test uh, children that are coming back to schools? They clearly informed us. In the same way as you've just highlighted, the NIH has put together uh, an RFP of sorts to highlight that we should be able to implement prediction tools. Again, it gets back to this humility. I think we should be able to be open-minded about what some of these tools can teach us. More efficiency in testing, whom should we test, how frequently we should test, and more importantly, who not to test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really thank you, uh, Ravi, for this uh, wonderful conversation. We are all looking forward to your talk at the RI conference and knowing that it's still a few months to go, I think it will also be very interesting to see what will change between now and January when the RI conference will happen. And it's a rapidly evolving field and, and we are really looking forward to your, uh, to your presentation. Uh, really thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Peter. As I was saying, I think the virus has mutated, so should we, and we will be in a different place at the yeah. time of the conference, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.